starting the recording. Session is being recorded. Okay, so I am going to talk about how Streamflow is measured, and this uh, lecture is aligned with the Streamflow data folder and content that we are covering this week in Watershed. Um, I We'll also have a bunch of web pages and other videos linked. And so even if you watch this, you should look at those other things as well. Um, I'm showing a screenshot from one of them. There's this water science school um, that the USGS has. Um, and a bunch of the web pages will be coming off of that. It's pretty awesome. And I particularly love the idea that as teenagers, we all sat along the riverbank wondering how much water is filling the river. Of course, I am a super nerd. So that is pretty much what I did as a teenager. But um, I, I love the idea that I'm not the only person who did that. So we're going to try and actually answer the question um, in this part of the um, water science school about how Streamflow is measured. But I'm going to do it in a little bit more detail than I've been able to find um, in one existing web resource. OK, so when I say Streamflow, other hydrologists might say discharge so dis or use the abbreviation Q. So discharge is the uh, volume of water flowing past a point in a given time. So uh, since it's a volume, it's got a uh, dimensions of length cubed. Um, so width, depth, and the length per time of volume. Um, and then per time. So we use units like cubic feet per second or cubic meters per second or million gallons per day. Um, all of these can be used express discharge. If you are working for the US government, like for the US Geological Survey, then you're going to use cubic feet per second. If you're working in the metric system, then you're going to use cubic meters per second. Now, if you have a rectangle, let's see if I can draw a rectangle. If your channel looks like this, then measuring the width and the depth isn't such a big deal, right? But even a simple channel looks more like this. And real channels are often rocky and irregular. And so there's not just one depth in the channel. The width as the channel fills and empties of water is going to vary over time. And of course, velocity is going to measure uh, vary depending on whether you're measuring it down here or over here, or whether you're measuring it on a sunny day or a rainy day. Um, and so we have to really um, get into the weeds of the details of how to measure, in particular, depth and velocity in order to calculate discharge. Width is a little bit less of a problem, because what we'll do is we'll use a survey of the channel cross-section to relate depth and width and get to the area of the channel. OK. So in an alternate world, I could take you on a field trip to a stream gauge, and it would look something like this. Um, and what you see is a, a box, a metal box of some sort, or sometimes a wooden box, near a river uh, with an antenna and a solar panel. And then this one has a, uh, a rain gauge right up at the top. All right. Um, and the and the words USGS emblazoned on it. And so this is a USGS stream gauge. Uh, just fun facts. The USGS doesn't put the letter U in stream in gauge and they also run stream gauge all together. Um, so when you see me spell it G-A-G-E, I am not misspelling it. I'm spelling it the way the USGS does. Um, and these stream gauges, what they're actually measuring is depth, which they call stage, right? Um, or gauge height. All those terms just mean the depth of the water relative to some reference elevation. So this is just a screenshot from a few years ago of a creek near Charlotte, North Carolina. And we can see that the gauge is measuring um, depths as low as just over three feet and just as high as 11 feet um, over the space of the storm here. Um, these depth measurements are super accurate, 0.01 inch, and they are recorded usually every 15 minutes in urban streams. They might be recorded every five minutes because the streams rise and fall so quickly. And if you have a really groundwater fed stream or a big river where stage isn't rising or falling very quickly, then they might record it every 30 minutes or even every hour. Um, 
The data are then, they're recorded on a data logger inside the stream gauge, um, and then they are transmitted to a satellite um, every hour or so, and then they go live on the, on the web. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more, uh, or quite a bit more, about this idea that this stage record is for one place, right? So wherever this gauge is measuring, we're really getting one cross-section in the stream, right? So we're just measuring that change in depth at that one very specific place. Okay, so if we go, if we sort of open the box and we look inside, we're going to see a couple of different possibilities. So let's start over here with the, the stilling well. And there is a video linked, or two videos linked, that show you stream gauges with stilling wells. So basically, the way this works is that you um, don't want to measure water depth right in the stream because there's turbulence and there's waves and there's ducts and other things that can cause it, the data to be a little noisy. Um, and so what you do is you dig a well near the stream. And then um, you have pipes that go between the stream and the well. Um, and then inside the water, it is still, hence the name stilling well. And you have something that measures a, a float that very accurately floats on the surface of the water in the stilling well. And that is connected uh, via a cable to some sort of recording device uh, inside the gauge, gauge house, is what we call it. Um, so that is one way and kind of one of the main ways uh, that water depth has been measured at stream gauges. Another way and one that I see a lot um, in urban streams or places where you can't dig a well into the bedrock or the surrounding materials very easily is uh, this bubbler method. And so this one's, I think, really, really cool because what they do is they basically force bubbles of air out of a tube placed at the bottom of the stream. And then the harder uh, the instrumentation has to push to push the bubbles out of the end of the tube, the deeper the water. So there's this relationship then between the resistance to pushing the bubbles out of the tube and the water depth, um, and that allows the instrumentation to convert it to water depth. And it's this very tight relationship so we can get these highly accurate depth measurements from it. Another way uh, that you can measure depth that is done at some sites, and we also have these in some of our urban streams, is to actually put a radar or an ultrasonic sensor on a bridge overlooking the stream. Um, this is good if you are having a lot of problems with erosion or deposition of the stream bed, so your stream profile might be changing. That might make it hard to anchor sensors um, and those bubblers or stilling wells into the stream bed or where you have a lot of debris coming through the stream. So this is a contactless method of measuring depth. Um, it's not as widely used as the other methods. Um, I think the USGS, they are the most rigorous um, hydrologists you can imagine. And so they have very, very tight standards for uh, what they will accept in terms of technology. And they really prefer the old school stilling wells with floats and the bubblers. Um, one of the things they won't use, even though academic hydrologists like me uh, use them a lot, are pressure transducers. So we've talked about pressure transducers um, when we are talking about um, snow pillows and snow towel sites where we were, or weighing lysimeters. Um, so basically a pressure transducer converts weight to depth. Um, and then you correct out the atmospheric weight. So this is one of my former undergrads showing a pressure transducer in a little urban stream around here that we were using to get uh, stage measurements. Uh, so, you know, not as fancy as that USGS gauge house, uh, but kind of the same idea. So those are the main uh, four methods for re getting really accurate measurements of stage, but that's not ultimately what we want. Um, so this is a new text-heavy slide that I put together this morning. Uh, and what I'm really trying to get at in this slide is that, uh, as it says, the relationship between stage and discharge 
which again discharges what we want, um, is very closely tied to the shape of the channel, and so it's very specific to one location. So this image over here shows three different channels. They all have the same cross-sectional area, 10 square meters, um, but notice how different their depths are. And then do a little bit of mental imagining and picture the water in one of those channels going up by say a meter, right? And so if we have this broad, shallow channel, if we went down a meter, it would be dried out. If we went down a meter in the narrow deep channel, it would still be narrow and deep. It'd still be four meters deep. Um, and if we went down a meter in this channel here, uh, there wouldn't be a lot of water in the channel, but it wouldn't be completely dried out, right? And so those are gonna have, the different shapes of the channels are gonna control um, how big a change in, uh, depth translates to how much of a change in the area of the stream, the cross-sectional area of the stream, and how much water it can carry, right? Um, and so we can't say that just because, remember Mallard Creek from a few slides ago, just because that went up eight feet, that another part of the Mallard Creek channel would go up eight feet. It turns out that that Mallard Creek stream gauge is located in one of these really narrow, deep channels, um, and so it goes up and down a whole heck of a lot during storms, but other places, Mallard Creek has a big broad channel and a wide floodplain, and if it went up eight feet there, you know, houses would be in trouble. Um, and so we need to have something to translate uh, differences in stage or depth, which is what our gauge is measuring, to actual differences in discharge. So just a little bit more on that, kind of driving the point home. If all three of these channels were on the same stream and there weren't any tributaries coming in and there weren't any diversions coming out and there was no groundwater gains and no groundwater losses, they would all have the same discharge. So that's conservation of mass or what uh, hydrologists call the continuity equation. Um, so shape doesn't affect the discharge, right? The, amount of the things happening in the watershed affects the discharge, how hard it's raining and the stream flow generation processes and how big the watershed is, all of those things affect the discharge. Channel shape does not really have a significant effect on discharge. Um, and so if we change the channel shape, we change the stage, but we don't change the discharge. Um, another way that channel shape matters is of course, um, how much of the water is in contact with the bed or the banks and how much is being dragged along the bed or the banks. So you can see down here, um, one of the things we talk about in hydrology and, and open channel stuff is the wetted perimeter or the perimeter of the bed and banks in contact with the water. And so you can see that this semicircular channel here has a, a lot less of its um, water that's directly in contact with the bed or the banks. And so this is a very efficient channel shape, whereas these two channel shapes both have a higher wetted perimeter. And so more of the water will be feeling that roughness associated with the gravel or the cobbles or any trees that fell in the stream. And so that will be slowing the water down. Whereas in the semicircular channel, um, the water has the potential to move a bit faster, all else being equal. The other thing that can happen, you have a high flow or just a lot of sediment in your stream. And if you get deposition or erosion in the channel, that's gonna change the shape of the channel. That's gonna change uh, the stage or how much the stage changes as your discharge goes up and down. So we call this a stage discharge relationship. So uh, yes, so the stage discharge relationship, another, another term we call it is a rating curve. Uh, so we are trying to rate uh, the discharge for any given stage measurement. Um, and so you are measuring stage with your stream gauge, with your float or your bubbler or your other sensor. You can measure that all the time. But in order to get this axis, the discharge axis, we need to go out and manually measure stream flow. And the big thing that we need to do is measure velocity um, all through the stream channel. And so if we, and by we, I mean 
any hydrologist, I spent a lot of time developing relationships like this, but USGS hydrologic technicians have this as one of their primary jobs. They go out at all sorts of different stream flow conditions, so high stages, low stages, stages in between, and they make these manual measurements of discharge so that they can fit some sort of statistical relationship, and I've just shown this really, really simple one here, um, to the data. And then they can use that equation to um, take their every 15 measurement, 15 minute measurements of stage and translate that into a discharge. So in this example up here, there are measurements at you know, zero foot and one foot and two foot and three foot and so on stage. Um, and you can tell it's made up data because they'd never have measurements at exactly those points and no points in between. But let's say that um, they have a stage measurement now of one and a half feet. They can use this relationship, this um, regression relationship that they've developed with the stage measurements and the discharge measurements they have to predict what discharge is. So at one and a half feet stage, then discharge might be something like 12 cubic feet per second. Um, and that's how we go to actually having measurements of stage, but getting the graph that we ultimately want, which is a hydrograph, which is this continuous record of discharge over time. So this is that same Mallard Creek record that I showed you for stage. And now what we can see is that stream flow goes as low as 10 cubic feet per second and up to between 1,000 and 2,000 cubic feet per second at the height of the storm. Um, and I have another video on Blackboard that kind of goes through how to look for this data on the USGS website and how to um, read these graphs and how to download the data and everything you need to do with the data. But uh, right now we're just going to talk about how we make the data. Okay, so we can measure stage, we can measure water depth. That's a relatively easy thing to do. It's relatively easy to automate. Um, and then we need to develop this rating curve or stage disk relationship. And the key thing we need hydrologic technicians to go out in the field and do is get us those velocity measurements. So why the heck is this so hard? Why don't we have nifty engineering technology to get these velocity measurements for us in an automated way, in a way we can do stage? Here's the problem. Velocity isn't just one number in the stream. It is variable all over the place. We've already talked about um, drag on the channel bottom and banks. So here's a very kind of triangular channel. Um, and, and what we're showing in this diagram is um, contour lines of equal velocity. So down here near the bottom of the channel, it is 1.3 meters per second and then up more in the middle of the channel it's 1.9 meters per second so we have this vertical variation associated with drag from the channel bottom there's a little bit of drag from the atmosphere at the channel surface um, that's usually pretty small but you do end up with um, especially if it's like the wind is blowing upstream um, you can you can have a little bit of slowdown right near the water surface as well. Um, and of course, the you know, if your channel bottom is full of big boulders, um, then it's going to exert more drag on the stream uh, flow. And we actually talk about, and I'm not going to, I'm skipping some details that I would normally cover, but it actually creates a boundary layer here near the base of the stream as flow um, velocity goes to zero right at the stream bed. All right, so we have this vertical variation, but our channel doesn't just have a bottom, it also has banks, and so we get a, a cross stream or um, a lateral variation, and if your stream channel is curvy, then that's gonna have a different uh, velocity pattern than if your channel is straight like this one. Um, it also varies 
in a downstream direction, and then it varies over time. And so the next couple slides are going to kind of take us through the details of these spatial and temporal variations of velocity, which hopefully, again, the goal here is to appreciate why it's so hard to get that velocity number that we need to actually measure stream flow, and why even in 2020 we are reliant on brave hydrologic technicians to go out in really terrible weather to get the high stream flow measurements um, and get these measurements. And then after we've talked about why it's hard, we'll show you how they actually do it. Okay, so these are some um, vertical velocity profiles, and this is not the slide I intended to keep when I hit some slides. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the things that you can see uh, in this slide, so this is a little bit of a complicated slide, we have uh, velocity in feet per second down here. And then this is a weird way that they are showing depth over here. They are showing it um, in terms of a natural log scale uh, for feet. And so what they're really doing is they're really um, expanding or blowing up the area close to the stream bed. And then they are um, uh, kind of compressing the distance higher on the water column. But what you can see really clearly in these velocity profiles is that effect of the drag on the bed. So right down here, very close to the bed, our velocity is point, less than 0 0.32 feet per second. And then when we get higher up into the water column, um, where we're not impacted by that drag on the bed, our velocity is as high as 0 0.44 feet per second. And um, under normal conditions, under the profile I meant to show, uh, that velocity then kind of stays steady all the way up towards the stream surface. And that's more of what we see in this one. Um, we see uh, it kind of peaking near uh, partway up the water column, and it should stay steady towards the stream surface. But this one, of course, doesn't. The velocity is declining here as we get close to the surface. And this is a great example of um, that, that wind effect that I talked about. So this is, a, a, this is a depth profile of velocity that was actually taken during high wind conditions. OK, so now you're like, man, that's a lot of data to get velocity at one place in the stream. And you just said it was going to vary laterally as well. Most of the time, we don't do this. Uh, and I'll go through the rule of thumb for how to measure velocity in a stream. But a lot of the time, we take uh, measurements in shallow streams at just 60% uh, of the way up um, from the bed. And um, if this were a normal profile, if it were one like I um, am drawing on now, uh, that would give you the average velocity for the whole vertical profile. Um, if we have deeper flows or if we have more complicated things going on, we take a couple more measurements, uh, but we don't take anywhere near the number of dots shown on this graph for normal stream gauging purposes. Uh, we take a couple more measurements, we average them, we call it a day, and we move on because we're actually going to do this over a whole series of locations across the stream. And I will post, there's a really cool time lapse video of a USGS hydrologist taking the stream flow measurements and moving across the channel. It's very sped up, so you don't have to watch the whole thing. Um, okay. So, again, this is another of these contour pictures, kind of reiterating what I was talking about a couple slides ago. So, we have this drag near the channel bottom, and we have. Um, uh, drag along the channel sides. And um, if we have a meander or a curve in the channel, we get faster flow near the outside and slower flow um, near the point bar inside of the meander bend. Right? So um, just like, uh, you know, if you're watching an indie car race, uh, everybody hugs, or if you're a runner, everybody hugs the inside lane um, because they have to run less distance to get around the curves. So the same thing, 
in the banks uh, or in the meandering channel, velocity is lower over here on the inside of the meandering bend, and the water on the outside of the meandering bend essentially has to move faster in order to keep up. It's also got less drag associated with it because the channel is deeper here. Of course, the channel is deeper here because the velocity is faster and it's eroding more, so it's all very circular. Geomorphology and hydrology go together well. All right, um, and then uh, velocity varies in a downstream fashion as well. So starting over on um, on the mappy side of things, this is just a really cool geomorphological map from a mountain stream in the Pacific Northwest or Alaska, showing all the sort of variations you might see in a reach. This reach has a lot of wood in it, and so you've got pools, and you've got scour pools, and you've got riffles. And if you go measure velocity in any of those places, uh, it's going to vary depending on the roughness in the channel and how constricted it is. And even though flow up here, discharge up here, is the same as discharge down here, uh, the velocity that you measure may be different. The channel cross-section you measure may be different. It's just when you multiply them all together, you get the same discharge, conservation of mass. Uh, the other thing that happens is that on a bigger scale, if you head downstream, you go from a mountain stream like the one I just showed you to uh, the Ohio River, uh, your velocity tends to increase. So that's what's shown on this graph here. We've got velocity here. Um, and then they're just, um, ooh, that was kind of a crazy underline there. Um, they're just showing you... Uh, the flow under similar conditions is the easiest way to think about this as you move downstream. Um, and so in big rivers, even though they're not as steep, velocity tends to be higher than in small mountain streams because there's so much less roughness, there's so much less bed and bank resistance, there's less drag on the water. Um, in part because the sediment tends to be smaller, but in part just because the channel's so much bigger, there's so much more flow in the stream that most of the water really isn't in contact with the bed, and it's up in that sort of free stream region um, with near constant velocity. All right, and for my live audience, if you guys have questions, go ahead and raise your hand at any point or type something into the chat, and I will be able to see that. Otherwise, I will just keep plowing on. Okay. Um, the other thing is the turbulence, so this sort of rapid mixing of flow. Um, and again, I'm skipping over some, some fluid mechanics that I would normally cover, but the idea that when you have, if you, um, if you dropped food coloring into something and stirred it, it would get all mixed in, right? That's turbulence. Um, and that's happening in stream channels all the time. Um, and that means that, the flow is, even in one small area, the flow isn't moving at a constant velocity. And even if you measured in one spot in the stream for a minute, you would still see variations in velocity. Um, so we have these small rapid fluctuations in velocity, and that's illustrated up here in figure D. Um, so this is uh, over time, over 100 seconds, just showing all variations in velocity in this one spot, right? And those are the effects of turbulence. So when we do need to measure velocity in a spot, we can't just stick our probe in for a second and say, oh, that's the velocity, because it is just one snapshot of the velocity. Instead, you have to stand there for a minute um, and average out the readings over the course of the minute or so that you're at each position in the stream. So you should be starting to get the picture that there's a lot of velocity measurements that go into a single stream flow measurement. All right. The other thing, of course, what's in um, the second part of this figure is that um, as discharge goes up, remember, let me try to write it out here, Q equals width times depth, whoa, that's a bad D, and velocity. Um, 
that not only does depth up as there's more flow in the stream and width goes up depending on the shape of the channel, but velocity also increases. And again, we can kind of intuit that out um, because as the channel gets bigger, as there's more water in it, uh, less of the water is in contact with the bed or the banks, so less of it is experiencing that drag or that friction, more of it's in the free stream, and so velocity can increase. And this is just some example data showing what this might look like for a particular stream cross-section. Okay, so that's the theory. That velocity is complicated and hard to measure, so how do we actually do this in practice? And I will link to a little USGS website or PDF or both uh, that go through this as well. And you will get a chance to practice this in the problem set 11. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but here's what you do. You divide the stream up into essentially boxes and you make a measurement of velocity in each of the boxes. And so um, you actually want to divide the stream into to subsections or verticals. Um, I would say a minimum of 10 in most streams more is better because the more verticals or subsections that you can make, um, the less flow is in each one when you do your math. And that means that if you're a little bit off in one measurement, you aren't throwing off the whole number that you're trying to compute. Um, so the USGS protocol for this says that no more than 5% of your flow can be in any one um, subsection. And that means that a USGS hydrologic technician needs to be measuring at least 20 subsections um, and actually really more than 20 subsections. Um, I spend a lot of time measuring velocity in very narrow streams, very small streams, and I find it hard to get that many measurements, so I'm a little bit more relaxed about it. Um, so then what you do is you measure the depth at each place that you're going to measure the velocity, um, and then you figure out uh, what what we call the six tenths depth is, and that is 60% of the way from the water surface down to the bed, or 40% of the way up from the bed. And that, if you're, here's our normal velocity curve, the assumption that we make for shallow water, um, that depth, that magic six tenths depth, is where our mean velocity is likely to be. And so that means that if we make one measurement um, at six tenths depth for each of these subsections, right? If I could control the drawing, I could make little marks in each of these subsections at the six tenths depth, then we'd be getting the idea. Um, then we'd be getting the average velocity for each of those subsections. And because uh, we're measuring the depth of that subsection, and we know how far apart our measurements are. Now we've got a width, depth, and velocity for a little box, a little subsection of the stream, and then we can sum up those boxes and get the total uh, discharge in the stream. And again, in the last problem set, which I will post here in the next few days, um, you will actually use some streamflow data that students collected last year, and you will do this calculation. If your flow is deeper, um, your curve ideally still looks like the one at the bottom of the screen, but it might not. More things might complicate it, things like we've seen, like wind and rocks. And so in that case, you measure at um, 20% and 80%, and then you take an average of them. And again, each of these measurements has to be done over some period of time to account for those small turbulent fluctuations. Okay, so you have to do all of this. Everything on this slide gives you one number stream flow. And I'm just gonna back up for a minute. Remember that what we are ultimately trying to do, so each, each of those things that I described on the last slide gives you one of these points. And the idea then is that hydrologists go out to a gauging station under lots of different conditions 
and get these points to develop this stage discharge a relationship or rating curve. And you can actually see on the USGS website when they've been out in the stream and making these measurements. I have a little video showing what that looks like on the USGS website. Um, but the shortcut is that basically if you're looking at the high graph, you can toggle a feature and you can see a little X showing that a hydrologist was out at a particular time and making that measurement. Um, you can actually see their measurement data um, and see the stage discharge relationship that they develop or the rating curve that they develop um, all through the USGS website and that is covered in one of the other videos. Okay, so we're out there, let's pretend we're USGS hydrologic technicians making one of these stream flow measurements. We know we're going to need to do it in at least 20 subsections, we need to know the depth, and we're going to need to know the velocity. What does that actually look like in practice? Okay, best case scenario, it looks something like this. Um, so this is me in my younger days in one of my uh, field sites in Oregon. Um, so I'm out there in hip waders. I've strung a tape measure across the stream. Um, I have a flow meter uh, that I'm carrying here. It's not entirely waterproof, so I'm trying to keep it dry. I have what's called a weighting rod, and this weighting rod is um, essentially got a meter stick built into it, but it also helps me do the math and convert to that six tenths depth. And so I go to the spot on my, my measuring tape, uh, I measure the depth with my weighting rod, I set the probe that's under the water, and I'll talk about that in a second, so that it's measuring at the six tenths depth, and then I start my flow meter to record data for 30 seconds and give me the average. I write that down. During my PhD, I did it two times at every spot. And then I move over, say, a foot, and I repeat the process. And I keep slowly working my way across the stream um, and making this stream flow measurement. And it's beautiful, and it's glorious, and it's a lot of fun. And it's one of my very, very favorite things to do that I don't get to do as much anymore as I wish I did. Um, in the old days, the way what what's under the water surface is a set of spinny cups uh, like these pictured at the top. This is a AA type flow meter. Um, and so the water spins the spinny cups and either gets recorded electronically or in the old, old days, you actually wore headphones and they would produce a little click each time there was a full revolution and the hydrologist would count the number of clicks in a set period of time. Um, there are also electronic flow meters um, and there are more complicated um, acoustic Doppler current profilers or acoustic Doppler profilers that are starting to be used. Um, again, the USGS is really concerned about um, the best possible methods. And believe it or not, the spinny cups still meet their uh, criteria if um, they are properly calibrated from time to time. Um, so that's not the only thing they use, but you will still see those um, type of uh, current meters or velocity meters in use. All right, so this is wonderful. If your stream is weightable, it really is one of the most fun things in the world to do. Um, but what happens when you're measuring something bigger and you can't weight it? What do you do then? Well, sort of the same thing, uh, but heavier and from a bridge. So in this picture, these are some USGS hydrologic technicians. Um, and we have the, um, the spinny cups are here. They are attached on a wire um, coming down from this crane, and there's a big winch here. Um, and so, and then this is a really heavy lead weight. Maybe not lead, but really, really dense metal. I dropped one on my fingers and been hurt for weeks. Um, and these can weigh hundreds of pounds. And so they're basically big singers. Um, so that they get lowered, this guy cranks on the winch, it lowers the whole apparatus into the stream, down to the stream bed. 
He can measure then how deep the stream is, crank it back up, thanks to the magic of pulleys to make this possible, to the 6 tenths depth or the 0.2 and 0.8 depth. Um, and then um, the torpedo shape of this weight helps orient it so that everything is oriented in an upstream downstream orientation so that the spinning cups are, are measuring the main bit of the flow. And you can actually see there's kind of a little um, tail on the velocity meter here and that's helping with the orientation as well. So that is another main way um, that that's measured. But this whole process, it's the same process. They do this at one spot. They move the crane over a couple feet. They lower it down. They repeat the process again. So a typical discharge measurement takes in the vicinity of a half hour to an hour to complete all the way across the river. So this is great if you have a bridge. But what if your stream is too deep or dangerous to wade and you don't have a bridge? Well, you could get in this thing. Um, this is a, a cable way and a cart. So you climb up the tower in the woods here and get into this basket um, off the tower, which you can then winch out uh, over the river. Let's see, your view looks something like this. So there you can see the hand crank up there in the top of the picture. Um, and uh, dangle <laughs> above the river in this cart with your heavy weighted current meter, lowering it down to the stream, making your measurement, reeling it back in, winching yourself along the cable way a little further, and repeating the process. I am not making this up. Real people have this as a job. This is either like this amazing dream come true or kind of a nightmare, depending on how you feel about heights and edges and, and engineering. Um, if you want to collect water quality samples, you can use a similar setup, um, suspended sediment samples. So it's not just for making discharge measurements, but this is, this is a major way that um, you can make discharge and water quality uh, measurements in a place that is not safe to wade and doesn't have a bridge. Now, obviously, this is a non-trivial piece of infrastructure. You don't just set one of these up for each measurement. These are long-term installations. Another technology um, that is coming into play and becoming more and more important because it's flexible um, is an acoustic Doppler current profiler. So um, these are used in all sorts of applications, but they're particularly helpful during floods. Um, because they um, don't require like a fixed cableway or bridge, you can get out there in a boat. Um, so here's some USGS folks out in a boat and um, behind them they are towing this um, ADCP. Um, you could also tow one from a bridge, you can tow one from a kayak. Um, and basically there's a GPS on the boat so it knows precisely where it is. Um, and there is this uh, Doppler uh, profiler, the sensor that looks down from the boat and looks out in multiple directions from the boat. So it is able to measure uh, the depth and measure the velocity. And it's not limited to measuring the velocity at one point. It can measure the whole vertical profile of velocity. So now, even if you're not able to go in a straight line across the stream, even if your boat is kind of going upstream and downstream because there's floodwaters and there's difficult conditions, um, hopefully you can get kind of close enough to things and get a complete enough picture that you can actually do this more complicated math, this sort of 2D math to get uh, a full uh, measurement of discharge. And so in the photo on the slide, um, this might look like a weird stream channel. I think my recollection uh, where I got this photo is that they are actually on a flooded road. Um, and so this boat is going across the flooded road. It's towing this ADCP behind it. This is not a place where you would have had a bridge because you don't expect flooding there. You can see trees over here and water flowing amongst the trees. So any place that you can safely get a boat, you can safely get a velocity measurement. So this is a really, really cool technology. Um, if you have a small stream, uh, you can make a really simple channel geometry, what we call a weir. Um, 
And so I've got some pictures of weirs here. And what these do is because they have a really simple geometry and they're taking advantage of some hydraulics. And um, the big thing is this, this drop um, at, below the weir. So sort of a, a mini dam, if you will. Um, you can actually have just a very fixed relationship between the water depth which again is easy to measure, uh, and the discharge over the, um, over the weir. And so these are pretty awesome. They're used a lot in small experimental watersheds, um, sometimes in urban engineer channels, but um, they are, they make fish unhappy, right? Because you can't swim over that very easily. Um, and also there'd be a real hazard for any stream or river that there might be boats or boaters or tubers or you know people. Um, and so they are not, they don't tend to be used in larger streams. All right, if all else fails and you really just um, can't get in a stream to make uh, classic measurements with a current meter or an ADCP and you can't build a weir, what can you do? Uh, you can invoke some geochemistry and some dilution to make it happen. So this is just an example from a stream we really could have gotten a, a measurement the more traditional way in, um, but dilution gauging is, very, very useful, particularly for really, really low flows. I've also used it in um, steep whitewater conditions where there was just no way we could safely get in the stream. Um, and we didn't have a bridge to do it from the top. So basically what you do is you add a, a chemical tracer. So in this case, it's a red dye called rhodamine, um, but salt is also commonly used. And um, you add it into the stream, it gets mixed in. So here we're adding it, hmm, suddenly my red color is not so useful. Um, we're adding it here. And you can see it's coming as this point source, but as we move downstream, it's getting mixed in. That's our turbulence in action. And if we were to go farther down the stream, the whole stream would be very faintly pink. Um, and so you could put, a sensor in the stream or collect water samples of, from the stream some distance downstream, measure the concentration of that red dye um, over time and use the dilution between the concentration where you put it in and the concentration where you're measuring it to calculate the volume of stream flow. Um, so with this red dye, we would use a fluorometer, so either a field fluorometer or bring samples back to the lab um, and do the math that way. With salt, it's pretty easy because you can do um, just a conductivity sensor in the stream. Uh, the red dye is more fun to look at. So those are the main ways that we can measure velocity and stream flow. And so to summarize all of this, and the last thing I have to show today is just um, really putting it all together. So again, um, we need to have manual measurements of a velocity at a whole bunch of different depths. Um, every time we get these velocity measurements, we also are getting the area because we're measuring the depth each place we measure velocity over a width. Um, and so each one of these manual measurements gives us one dot on our rating curve. And we use that rating curve then, this relationship to, um, to be able to predict discharge or to be able to say what the discharge in the stream is even when we're not out there. So even at you know 2 a.m. when no hydrologist is out there, you can say, you know what, if the stage in the stream is two feet, then discharge must be three cubic feet per second. And if the stage in the stream is nine feet, woo, <laughs> The stage of the stream is nine feet. The discharge is 900 cubic feet per second in this example. Um, and so uh, a big part of the job of USGS hydrologic technicians is building these rating curves with all these manual measurements. And there's a lot of science and art that goes into the measurements. There's also a lot of science and art that goes into finding good places um, to site gauges. Uh, and that's just sort of my final note here. Remember we talked about how stage was really affected by the shape of the channel. So if you put your stream gauge in a place that's prone to erosion or deposition, 
and that happens, then you need to adjust or even completely start over with this rating curve that you've just spent all this blood, sweat, and tears developing. Um, and so there are, is a lot of um, key features that you look for in the River Channel when establishing a USGS stream gauge or any other stream gauge for your own research project um, so that you don't put a lot of work into developing a, a rating curve and then have a flood change the channel geometry and make you start over. Um, so that is what I wanted to cover with the um, how to actually measure stream flow. I'm going to turn off the recording now and then let my live audience ask me any questions they have. <laughs>